Good evening, everyone. I call to order the meeting of the San Francisco Elections Commission. Today is Wednesday, January 20th, 2015, and the time is now 6.01 p.m. I'm President Jordan. Secretary Hewitt, can you take the roll? Uh, Commissioner Donaldson? President. Com President Jurai? Here. Commissioner Dunn? Here. Commissioner Harris? Here. Vice President Rowe? Here. Commissioner Sapplant? Here. Commissioner Yu? Here. And we also have with us today Director John Arnes, Deputy City Attorney Joshua White, and of course Commission Secretary Nadia Hewitt. Okay, item number two, general public comment. Public comment on any issue within the Elections Commission's general jurisdiction unless otherwise included in the item on this agenda. Seeing none, let's move on to item number three, approval of minutes for the previous meeting. Discussion and possible action to approve minutes for the December 16, 2015 Elections Commission meeting. Yeah, I have a motion. I move to approve the um, meeting minutes from December 16, 2015. A second. Is there any commissioner discussion? Seeing none, a public comment. Seeing none, I'm sorry, could you do it? Commissioner Donaldson? Yes. President Jordan? Yes. Commissioner Jen? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Vice President Ray? Yes. Commissioner Spont? Yes. Commissioner Yu? Yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Let's move on to item number four, commissioner's reports. Okay, would anyone like to start this off? I can just let everybody know that I am being reappointed for another term. Congratulations. So it's five years went by fast, didn't it? I know. <laughs> it's crazy. I know. So there, I wanted to mention two things. Um, first, I'm continuing to work with Supervisor Mayor's office and educating the members of the Board of Supervisors about the open source resolution that we passed and in various stages of communication which, with each of their offices. I've um, sent you know, these two emails to each of their offices. I've met with Supervisor Yi, and I spoke briefly with Supervisor Kim and uh, a staff person in Super Supervisor Mars' office. And I'm, I'm working on setting up meetings with all of them. Um, just to take some time to, to get on their schedules. And then um, as far as the website, I, I did uh, kind of update the formatting of our website to match up with the new um, system that they set up for us. And I approved help and slow for you know if you're doing it from a mobile device. And I think the one the two things are left are to um, kind of fix how they um, handled our meetings from 2015, kind of bring it back to how it before. And um, there's a little bit more tweaks we can do for the mobile here. And then uh, my understanding is that Secretary Fields will be attending the training. Is that next week? Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyone else before we move on to public comment? I would, I would just like to make, to make a formal request of our secretary. It would be really helpful if when you post the either cancellation notice or the agendas, if you could email the commission when you do that. It gives us a few days extra to review them uh, and just serves as a reminder. So for all BOPEC meetings and regular commission meetings, simultaneously when you post the agenda or cancellation notice, please email it out to the commission and to, if you have a list of the public who gets notices, email it to them as well. Okay, a public comment. Commissioners Brent Turner uh, on behalf of the California Association of Voting Officials. We just wanted to congratulate Commissioner Rowe on staying with the commission and going through this with us. We appreciate her great work. Also, I just wanted to comment on President Jordanik's uh, report that um, we're glad to hear that he are reaching out to the supervisors here. We're also doing that on a statewide basis, reaching out to supervisors throughout the state as well as um, other interested parties, uh, registrars in particular, uh, other counties around the Bay Area and statewide, talking about the good work that's going on here and encouraging their participation moving forward. So thank you. Good, thank you, Mr. Turner. Well, one other thing I wanted to mention is I wanted to thank Director Arnes. Um, he's been very helpful in kind of helping me understand the budget process and giving me some advice on people to talk to. 
Okay, um, seeing no further commissioner discussion, let's move on to item number five, director's report. Good evening. Uh, on the admin side, we're getting the uh, budget put together and we expect by uh, in two weeks to have it uh, done and we'll get it to the boat pack by I guess, the 29th or so. Uh, so the boat pack on the 3rd uh, can review the budget and then submit to the, to the full commission uh, in February. Uh, we're also getting the uh, materials and supplies organized in, in the, uh, for June and also thinking about November. Uh, also, uh, you might have seen, or I don't know if you're, so this past last week, and I think again tomorrow, I didn't check the rules committee agenda, actually, I was going to break shot up here. Uh, There's two items of the rules committee last week regarding elections. One, uh, it was one big uh, package that contained two charter sections that were bifurcated. One charter charter section had to do with, with changing how we use ranked choice to elect mayor. That that uh, amendment amendment was was tabled to the call of the chair. Probably won't go forward. It doesn't go forward in for the November election. But the item that was continued for I think tomorrow um, would be the in relation to the mayor filling vacancies on the board and the, the board president filling. Uh, they can see in the mayor's seat if that were to occur, and then the, the board president would have a simultaneous, the simultaneous duties of being the board president and also uh, being the acting mayor uh, until a, a mayor was elected in a special election. Uh, that will be heard tomorrow, I believe. Um, uh, Commissioner Kronick was there last week. I don't know if you <coughs> speak on that with your reports or not. Um, and I, I probably will show up tomorrow. I don't know if I will actually. I, was, I appeared last week, but I, there was no questions for me, so I may not even show up tomorrow. But those were two items that were before the board, so you know, you did, you did, uh, you weren't aware of it. Um, then also uh, for ballot distribution, uh, they're, they've been receiving the retirement uh, election ballots, so if any of you haven't voted yet, there's still time to get your ballot into the department. Uh, we've also, they've also been putting together, looking at their projections from the last election compared to the actuals, and also preparing the projections for June. Uh, we don't prepare the, the November projections quite yet. Uh, we're waiting. We just don't do it this early yet. Uh, we'll, we'll do it um, probably after the June election, or just right around the June election. Um, the campaign services, I've been receiving a lot of filings uh, from people who want to run for central committee. Uh, we've had a few petitions come in. Uh, they've also been working on the calendars and guides, first for the June primary, but then, then secondarily for the, the uh, November general election. Uh, an outreach, they've been attending uh, events. They're going to a nerd night tonight, actually. Um, they went to the UC, USCIS uh, ceremony today uh, across the bay. Uh, they worked out with uh, MTA to get uh, placards inside the, the muni buses for both uh, the June and the November elections. Uh, they're also working on the uh, public service announcement for the June election. Uh, and all the, the topic of the, of the uh, PSA will be uh, voting by mail. So that'll be the PSA that we put out. Um, on the poll worker side, they've been reviewing the materials and supplies, also working with other divisions and um, some projects. Um, and also in the training materials, and seeing how they can, they can improve them. And the precinct services. So they were sent out their availability letters to uh, potential polling sites for not just June, but also November. They're trying to do a, a double whammy where we get uh, people agreeing to host polling places, not just for one election, but for both elections. We're looking, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out if we can get an extra stipend to uh, the polling places and also the poll workers who, who work both elections, both the June and November election. Uh, so we're still trying to get that figured out if we can uh, provide extra stipends on what they would be. On the publication side, uh, we've, we've already begun the, the formatting of the masthead for the ballots, um, getting things organized, getting schedules organized, uh, not just for the hard copy, but also for the, uh, the electronic ballots on the, on the touch screens. Uh, technology group, they've just been uh, trying to catch up with the databases and application development that we have. And voter services, they've been getting ready for uh, the department going live in mid-March for the uh, vote count, the statewide database. So in, in mid-March, uh, 
San Francisco will, um, will, will go live with that. Um, there has been some petitions coming in, they've, they've been in the process. Um, and then the warehouse been uh, conducting inventory and also trying to where we can streamline space and recycle items and also destroy the things that are past their retention days. So it's a, a quick rundown there. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for us? Um, yes, I had a question about the rules committee. The item that was tabled that is on my to come back, but just in case. What was that item that was tabled? So the idea was range choice voting to be still uh, applied to mayoral contests, but range choice we run to only the last two candidates instead of the, the, the last candidate. So once the rank choice was run, two candidates remained in the contest, uh, the department would actually uh, prepare and then conduct a December runoff election between those two candidates. So it was a combination of, of, of uh, rank choice voting and the old runoff elections from before we used rank choice voting. If, if, if no one candidate got over 50%. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, no one got above the threshold. Yeah, and, uh, Director Ernst mentioned I was at the meeting last week, and I was there as, as speaking as a member of the public. The, the Director Ernst, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the remaining provision on vacancies. What sort of effect would that have? Is that anticipated to have the department come next to elections per year or in the year? Uh, well, it just to be after election. So, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we 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 run a special license before. It's just it's just a timing issue, uh, so we have to you know locate polling places, recruit poll workers, go through uh, the entire process. There'd be a, a bit less time because you have a maximum I think 120 days uh, in, the, in the amendment, so you have uh, four months to, to organize. But the district is not so it's not so challenging for uh, for citywide. It's a more challenging effort. In the typical case, you'd have a vacancy would be created after the November election if someone moves on to higher office. Is that potentially, yeah, or someone, yeah, or someone, yeah, it's usually someone moved to a different office. That's usually how a vacancy, but you know, there, there are situations where people leave office prematurely. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Since I have not been in, in elections in a district that has uh, <coughs> utilized runoffs for some time. Uh, how much of a scramble is that compared to a regular election? Are these usually very taxing elections because you have very little time to do the runoff, or because the resources are already mobilized, is it easier? Well, for a mayoral, for a citywide? Yes. Yeah, six weeks after the, uh, the general? Yeah, they're challenging. Yeah, they, we, I mean, before we had ranked choice voting, even I've run a few uh, runoff elections as director, and I ran a few uh, before I was director. It's, it's a squeeze uh, to get from the general election day to, to run off. And then actually, if you have a tight race, you don't even know who the candidates are going to be. And you've got to get the ballots printed. Um, one real challenge uh, currently that did not exist previously is uh, state law allows, requires actually for overseas voters to receive the same ballot as do local voters. Whereas in 2002, when the, the ranked choice voting charter amendment was passed, uh, overseas and military voters voted only for federal offices, so they weren't included in the runoffs. Whereas in this current time, uh, if we had a runoff, then we have to uh, time the, the preparation and mailing of ballots to overseas and military voters. So we could, we really could not, we can't do it uh, within the six week time frame that existed prior to ranked choice because the minimum amount of time to provide an existing overseas or uh, military voter is 45 days to receive and vote that ballot to get back to us. So 42 days would be six weeks, so we'll be on time. Did you say you were not asked to speak at that meeting, so you haven't provided them with that I, feedback? No, I provided the feedback, but not, not during the meeting. Okay. I think you should let us know if it appears that they're about to do something that's impossible for the department because we may be able to speak as well and make sure that they don't put you in an in impossible situation. Or even challenging. I don't like the idea of having many overseas voters have their ballots essentially excluded in many ways. 
Any further comments before we move to public comment? Yes, actually, I have one, but I want to make sure anybody else wanted to comment on that last issue. <coughs> uh, you were mentioning the stipends. Uh, what is the current stipend in San Francisco for a poll worker? Uh, for inspector, I think it's 165 at the base, and then for a clerk, I think it's 145. And then you get some for the class, and then uh, if you fill out the, the ballot statement, I think we've done, we've added $5 for that, too, in the past. But I think it's 165 at the base. Okay, uh, public comment on this item. Yes, commissioners, very quickly, just to uh, not to continue to applaud you for your efforts for open source, but obviously we recognize that a lot of solutions to the issues that Mr. Ernst is bringing up will be reconciled as we move forward with the open source systems, turnaround times are reduced, and so forth. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, my name is Helen Duncan, and I'm in very sick. Um, I've been having my head with those uh, court hearings because I um, have pneumonia. I do see the doctors all the time. I still got the doctors um, wristband. But I'm getting better, and in my, uh, what you call, hair, hornet's nest. <laughs> disease I had, and it's um, been up, and uh, for that, thank you for um, you know, writing my commissions and doing everything legally and right, and that I was wondering why there was uh, having a difficult time getting in federal court hearings, and uh, not, not, not information that had been passing by, why that was a problem for a lot of these uh, issues in court hearings. And I went up there and they act like they were going to check me and keep me just going to the courtroom. So I said, well, uh, what's up? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, um, there no, there's no additional comments. Let's move on to Item number six, discussion of possible action to review the November 3rd, 2015 election. Okay, on this item, I thought we could divide the agenda item into kind of two parts. And, and first, I also want to let the commission know that I'm not personally going to push for any additional motions regarding the last election, uh, like we've discussed. So I thought we could start out by talking about some of the issues that, that we, um, I think we had some further questions about the election from the last discussion. And then we can talk, um, I thought we can have a little bit of a broader discussion about kind of what it means to assess the election after that. But not with, not with um, this last election mind. So, um, you know, I, I repeat the last meeting and uh, Dr. Ernst, I know there were, I think, two kind of topics that some of the commission had questions about. And one was the, um, the rate of the challenge ballots compared to the last election. And I was wondering if you could uh, just share with the commission what, what your thoughts were on that kind of explanation of. Well, you know, why I don't know. I don't. I, mean, I don't. I, I don't. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, we did. We, as I said in boat back, we uh, when I went to Denver, they had uh, big placards in there where they and they uh, where they reviewed signatures and. So that started me thinking about our signature process. So we actually have their clockers here in our office now uh, to show us examples of, of handwriting and comparing, you know, different strokes. And, uh, and just as a reminder, people who are doing the signature verification. So we did we did look at our uh, our signature ver verification uh, processes. Uh, we, we were going to organize our own training to review signatures, but the state actually was holding uh, uh, signature verification training just before the election, so we, we, uh, we tend that. Uh, with our processes, considered how we, we were training the, um, the sympathy of folks who came in to help with the election. Uh, so we, we were reviewing our processes and uh, thinking how we, we did things before the election, not in anticipation of, of any more can of challenges than before. It wasn't, wasn't our thoughts at all. 
No, just just uh, uh, due diligence, really, because we had been a while, so we were going back to the topic. Uh, then also in District 3, there are a lot of other questions about uh, the activities of the campaigns. And then the DA's office was visiting, and I think that heightened people's uh, awareness levels a bit, too. Um, but in the end, we actually had the, our, our manager and our, our supervisor of the division that reduced, that's responsible for reviewing signatures do a final review of all the challenged uh, signatures on the, on the local mail ballot. So um, everything, so the process was good. And it's, the, you know, our more uh, experienced and really talented people in reviewing signatures did the review. So I, I don't doubt the process. Why the numbers themselves are higher, I don't know. I really don't know. That's one thing I said at both back too. Um, is this just one data point? Is it's going to be isolated, or is it going to is it going to uh, uh, combine into a similar data point in June? You know, that, that'll be interesting for me to see. Uh, we we do contact everyone who whose signature miscompares to what we have on file, uh, and so far I think we received around 300 uh, responses from people that actually returned the. The registration card we sent to them, you know, and they, they gave us a, a fresh signature sample. Um, so at uh, we sent out twenty five hundred, whatever it was, and we got three hundred back at this point. Uh, so I don't. The process I think was good. Uh, we had the right people in place uh, involved in the process, and uh, you know, I think June will will tell us if, if this was a, you know, this was an isolated. Uh, Data point really, or if this something will continue going on, and we need to, to reconsider, um, you know, what happens when we send the ballots. But uh, right now, I, I don't know. I just like that one thing I can say is, well, this is why we have some instruments compare compares. If we had just the temporary team of folks doing the, the, the verifications of signatures, then I then probably have some doubt. But since we we had our, our most, most experienced people involved at the, at the end, uh, I. I Fairly confident. I'm very, very confident actually um, about what we did uh, and how. Well, what happened before we received the envelopes? I don't know. I, I couldn't say. And it was spread throughout the city too. It wasn't like it was, you know, District Three or anything like that. So. Thanks. I'm actually not too familiar about what the legalities happened with the responses. Are the 2,500 roughly uh, notifications just saying that you your ballot wasn't counted, or is that also an opportunity to provide verification to count that ballot? And is that legal since it happened so far after the election? Right. So after after an election, after election day, we don't. Well, the law is changing now. Well, actually, some of them signed their envelope. We now have a lot of eight days going forward to to contact you and have you sign a piece of paper with your signature that we can actually apply to your ballot. And that's new going into the June primary. For the last election, after, after election day, we couldn't we couldn't add to the envelope. We couldn't add a signature if it wasn't there. We couldn't change signature. Um, but we would contact people. Um, it wasn't really, uh, uh, it, was, it wasn't a program that we focused on. We will now going forward. But Certainly have different protocols in place. So now we'll actually we'll be more engaged in trying to contact people before election day to get them to, to you know if, if they did sign in a way that doesn't compare to the, the registration card or other information we had on file all time, maybe to get some people to come down and uh, give us a signature sample. Um, but what we do, we send a letter saying that what we did is we sent people a letter saying your ballot didn't count because your signature didn't match what we have on file. So we need you to give us a, a new uh, sample. And so and the only way at that time for us to get a signature sample that we could use for a vote by mail ballot would be the registration card. That's always on the registration card asking for new registration. Thank you. When you get the 300 response, when you got the 300 or so responses back, is there, are you getting any feedback from any of those people? Are they protesting at all, or is it just here's my new registration card? I'm aware of one person that, got, that was upset about it, uh, but nothing's come to me. I actually didn't ask that question before I came up here, so I, I, nothing's come to me. But I'm, if, 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 if those, if, if, if there are questions or there's anger about this, uh, I'm not aware of it. I'll ask the question come back to you. I don't, I don't know. Do you know if the card that you send out 
seeks that information? Um, or does it, is it asking people if they have any comments or suggest, um, you know, I guess the, I don't know what the card looks like. If it just says, card. your card wasn't, oh, it's pure, well, you, you sent it a letter. letter, right? Right, yeah, so it's, it's a letter that, that indicates that we didn't count a ballot. And the reason was that the signature didn't match. The signature not on the album didn't match the one we had in the file. And so the only thing they send back is a pure registration card. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, were there additional questions? Yeah. Okay, were there additional comments about this issue? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question about the new. You said for the June election, there's a new law that gives you eight days to contact people and have them come in and give a new signature. Not a new signature. It's a, the, that law pertains to those who don't sign the envelope. So before on election after election, after, after the polls closed, I couldn't, for instance, ask Josh for a signature to get his envelope. Whereas now I've got eight days to track Josh down and get a signature from him that I can use to apply to his vote by mail ballot that he counted. And, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a registration card either. It can, it can be a form, it can be a letter, it can be anything. Have you set up, do you have your ideas of how you're going to address that issue yet, or is that still a work in progress? Still a work in progress. Yeah. And are there any legal obligations on the department to try to reach out to people? Uh, you know, I don't know if it says shall do this or not. Uh, I mean, we will. I, it's not even a question. Uh, I, I don't know the language. I, I didn't memorize the statute as far as if it's. I'm not sure either. I can, yeah. I can look at that. How, how big of a problem is it getting unsigned? Uh, every every situation is unique. I mean, like a lot of this, it, like phone numbers are the best way to, to call someone and say, hey, we, we've got your ballot here, but the envelope's not. There's no signature on the envelope. That's the easiest one to cure. That's the one. Those are the ones that usually get cured first. Because you can reach them. Right. How often does that occur? That you get the unsigned envelope? A few hundred. It's a few hundred times in an election. It's really it's really not common at all. And then uh, one thing I remember that a couple years ago I was asked question about if the same if if, if those if people repeat the same issues on their on their on, on their envelopes. So if someone doesn't if someone didn't sign one election, did they not sign three elections before as well? You know, was it something that they, they commonly uh, do? And so we, we did some queries and the people that, that didn't sign one election or had a signature miscompare or wrong and whatever it was People weren't repeating mistakes, so it was so every so every scenario, every situation, usually it's, it's its own little story. You know, as you reach out to people and try to resolve whatever issue they're about. And um, this this new law does that allow if it's a signature miscompare? Does that allow you to count the ballot if you, if you go through some process that convinces you that the voter was who they say they were? Are you allowed to? To count the vote before election day, within the eight days. The eight days. Would, yeah, I guess I don't know either before or. Yeah, the eight days is for no signature. Okay, so that wouldn't apply to a right. miscompare. Right, right. Uh, so with the miscompare, uh, you know, ideally we had people, you know, respond. We could talk to them, and it was just a matter. Of, uh, you know, maybe develop a script to get, you know, make sure that they're the ones that did cast their ballot. They know that they cast the ballot. Uh, then you can get a fresh signature sample. Then we can we can add that fresh signature sample to their registration record so that the next election it will count about this election. Then the next election we shouldn't have the same problem with the same voter because we've had a new, new sample. You know? So we're not asking people to re-vote or not having to resend out ballots or things like that. Um, just have maybe have a conversation with them if we can. Uh, but at some point we're going to have to get. A signature from these people and some sort of statement that that is their ballot. Right. Right. You can't just place a phone call and somebody says, "Yeah, it was me," and you then count the vote because you have no way of verifying that that actually is the person. Right. Right. Then if, you know, if we did that, why would we go through the entire process of verifying signatures and right. not one? You know? All right. A tricky issue. It is. Yeah, and you know, the signature is such a, you know, it's such a fundamental. Uh, component of the process of the vote by mail process. Right. You know, and there's there's so much service and there's there's so much uh, uh, you know helpfulness that that the departments give to voters to, to get these ballots to get them back to us to get them counted to inform voters about the, the you know the process of the ballot being printed and the envelope, mail, receiving and all that. 
But if that signature is not matching on the envelope, what's on the, what's in the bottle, you know, that that's the bottleneck right there. Uh, well, you have to take that very seriously oh, because yeah. if it weren't the same person, you wouldn't want to be counting that right. vote. So it's a it's a difficult issue that should be taken seriously. Right. I'm glad to hear you've got the extra level of reviewed by the supervisor or a manager, which should uh, reduce the false miscompares, I would right. think, but it doesn't really achieve the opposite because they're only doing the second level of review, so if something's not through the first time, that won't be picked up by the, by the second level, right? Yeah, and that's where spot checking comes in. So you have to spot check the work as it goes, as these envelopes go through, go through the process. And then, and we do spot check, we, we have spot checked in the past, I want to bolster that going forward as well, so we have a, a more defined sense of, of what the folks are coming, especially the temporary needed people who come in to, just for the election, to make sure that that not so much that they're they're catching everything, um, but they're that they're also not letting some things go through the process. So, um, you know, that was the original concern of one of the original concerns of the DA's office when I came in is that maybe ballots were getting through that, you know, for people that that. We're supposed to be casting them, um, so that there's that side of it. Then there's the other side that uh, you know uh, we're catching too many because we're just doing too little. So we, you've got to get to find that balance. And you don't want to overwhelm your final uh, checkpoint, which would be the manager supervisor, just get on thousands of things to do because you're just getting people just nervous at the keyboard. And then the spot checks come in because as you spot check the, the their work, you can um, you know if, you, if you're seeing a pattern. You can Hey, you know you're going a little too heavy. Here's why we, here, you know, here's what we think you're doing, or here's what you can do. If you have any questions, or you know, someone just doesn't get them to, to take them off the process altogether. You know? I imagine that's a really hard job to sit for hours at a time looking at signatures and focusing your attention with that kind of detail. But that's a really difficult job. It's not as bad as it used to be. Now that we have it more automated, because now we're not having to shuffle the the, the actual envelopes around that we used to. So now it's digital, and then, uh, and you can tell, once, once you've gone through several hundred signatures, you get a sense, you know, well, what's a good signature and, what, and what's a questionable signature, and kind of you get into a rhythm, and, and uh, so, yes, it is when you first start, but once you, once you get into it a little bit, then uh, it goes pretty quickly. It's not just one person reviewing the 10,000 novels that came in on a day, you know, you've got 10 people doing it, uh, and it might just take a couple of hours of the day, so it's not all day long. For a person to review those signatures. So on TV, there would be some magic technology that could do that process for you and identify false signatures. I take it there is no software currently that that does that. It's well, completely human. Well, we do. We don't have any software. There, there is software, signature verification software, character, character recognition software that uh, counties use. Uh, we don't. We don't use it. Uh, so. You, the, so some counties can set the software at, at a certain threshold where um, if, the, if the software thinks that a signature is less than 50% correct or valid, that it'll, it'll be challenged if it's over 50% or whatever percentage is a threshold, and then the software will challenge the ballot or then let the other ones go through. We don't do that. We, we, everything we do is manual. Is there a reason that you prefer not to use it? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's just better for us to have, have especially in San Francisco, um, it's probably better just the process is more open that way too. So if the campaigns or observers want to come and watch what we do, uh, they can actually see us go up. There's not some black box of reviewing signatures. It's, it's right there. It's people reviewing the actual signatures on the envelope uh, compared to the actual signature that someone registered with, you know, so people can actually watch that process. Um, you know, we're not having to go back and validate or explain uh, software doing that work too. So, and the, the especially when it's not open source. <laughs> right. Here, Mr. Kerner, when we get open source, maybe that will be a more reliable system. All better system, but. Um, but uh, so the so having the manual verification actually, I think, works better for us and not having to physically move all the envelopes like we used to when we verify signatures totally changes the amount of effort that goes into having to do that work. Um, before, I mean, it, was just, it was just physically moving trays and trays and trays. Now it's not. It's not now it's you get a screen with four signatures and you, you, you punch through it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not so horrible. Yeah. 
Thank you. I have one question of clarification. Um, you didn't say, and agree with me if I missed this, whether the eight days was eight days from the start of the election, and eight days after, or eight days from receiving the ballot. E plus eight. E plus eight. Yeah. So, and you know, you, that makes sense to you guys now? The eight days? Okay. Yes. Well, I should speak for everybody. Uh, I have a question. I registered to vote almost 50 years ago. So my signature has changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Would I be able to go into the election department and say, I'd like to sign another signature card? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or just register again, just, you know, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we prefer actually you do a web signature on a card, not use a DMV signature. Don't do it online. That's one concern that we have, because when people, now that there's the motor voter, when you sign on a signature pass, it's not the same thing as signing a piece of paper. You know, so we talk about the, the signature being a potential bottleneck and such a fundamental part of the vote by mail process, but now you're getting this different component in there. And then if you have to say that the, the finger signatures. So yeah, so I don't, th this is gonna evolve over time. I, I think, I don't think this is the first time we'll be talking about signatures. Okay, there was another topic that came up at the last meeting, that was the, um, in one of the tables in the memo I, I provided, was sort of uh, comparing the, the number of people that voted as shown by the election management system compared with the number of votes per the statement of vote. And I was wondering if you could, um, you know, talk about whether you know, you think you might know the, the cause for that and like anything that you might do in the future to, to um, you know, keep an eye on that issue or? Yeah, that could be a lot of things. Uh, we, we do look at it. So the bubbles, so every, every name on the roster, there's a bubble next to it. So if the bubble's not filled in potentially, the person wouldn't get history, which would be an I versus the state. So the ballot would count to show up in the statement of vote. But it wouldn't show up in Himes, which would be the voter history. Uh, it could be things like uh, voters, vote by mail voters coming to the polling places and putting their uh, their ballots in the in the, 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 the tabulator, uh, and then they, they put the the empty envelope in the red box. Um, so the ballot's been counted, but, but the law states that we can't count a ballot where the envelope's been opened prior to coming to our possession. So. I would give history to that particular person, but the ballots be counted and they go into the uh, statement of vote. Provisional uh, voting, someone, voters throw their provisional ballots in the, in the tabulator at the polls, the poll workers then catch it, um, but, and then the ballot and the envelope gets challenged. Cause they, so there's, there's all, there's things like that. Um, there's not any one thing. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a lot of this process, just, uh, just staying on the train uh, with what happens at the polls. Then really, uh, it's really good too, since you guys work as, as poll workers often, if something happens at the polls, make a note of it uh, on the ballot statement, um, in the roster, somewhere, just so that we get an, an envelope, uh, so we, we know what's going on. Um, that, that's always very helpful, because if there's that process, we, we don't know. You know, unless we're informed by it. And then at the canvas, we try to piece things together, but which you can, you can't put together an entire election um, after the fact. We try, but we, 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 don't, we don't always succeed, so. Thanks. Um, Commissioners, are there, were there any other um, comments about this past election before we can move on to the more general topic? Quick question, I, I take it you don't have any information from the DA? Relating to the District 3 issue? No, we don't normally, I mean, I, anything that would be public information the DA would issue, I normally wouldn't get something from the DA and say, here's our statement that you can, I can, I don't normally get that from them, actually. And I, I can say that, uh, you know, and I think I said at commissioning too, that, so I think it's, it's okay to say publicly. Uh, we'll work with the DA uh, for the June election, so if there's something in our process that would support uh, review or investigation for an election, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that with them before we go into June. And not so much for the June election, but for November, uh, to make the, so the general election will again have supervisors on the ballot, uh, District 3 will be on the ballot again. Um, so partly the conversation really hasn't ended. Uh, 
regarding District 3 uh, specifically, but also on this topic generally, uh, because we're, you know, we, we, we plan as a group to come back after this. We haven't had any meetings with them since the election. No. Okay, so the other one of the other things that came up at the last meeting was this. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this language that's in the charter about assessing the election, whether it's free, fair, and functional. And I thought we could kind of have a little bit of an open dis discussion today about that. I know, um, Josh, you, you, you looked into um, you know, the legalities of that. But um, I mean, one of the things I thought we could talk about is one of the things that came up at the last meeting was whether we even have enough information to, to make an assessment like that. And I was thinking if we don't have enough information, maybe we can talk about what are some, the types of things we might need in the future so we can better assess, you know, how uh, free, fair, and functional the election was. Deputy um, City Chairman, would you like to? Sure. The, the, so the language in, in um, Charter Section 13.103.5, which which addresses the duties of the uh, which addresses the duties of this commission, uh, you know, requires the commission to carry out quote an assessment of how well the election plan succeeded in carrying out a free, fair, and functional election. And so it sounds like last meeting, when unfortunately I wasn't able to be here, there was some discussion about what is what does an assessment mean? Does it require? Um, a, a vote on the question of, you know, was this election free, fair, and functional? Is, is that um, obligation satisfied simply by having a discussion? Or if there is a different type of motion required, what is it? Um, and the, you know, the, the sort of the short answer is, um, I, the commission has a lot of discretion. Um, there, there isn't any, there's certainly no case law interpreting what, you know, an assessment means. Um, and in, in, in sort of thinking about it, I, I think you have latitude. I think the absolute minimum would be you have to have a discussion, um, which, you know, which, which uh, the, you know, the commission has done in past elections, basically um, uh, addressing how well uh, the past election was conducted, whether it was free, fair, and functional. So that would be the absolute minimum. Um, uh, whether, you, whether you're obligated um, by that language to vote on a motion, um, I think the answer is no, you're not obligated to do that. Um, whether you can do that, um, it, I think is up to you. Um, uh, my, my own sense is that, is that you know, that, that having the discussion um, and really kind of like getting into, you know, more details about like the strengths and weaknesses of how the election was carried out um, sort of speaks to that assessment requirement more than just sort of a narrow motion, you know, I move, you know, the commission moves, uh, you know, or, or passes a motion to stating that this election was free, fair, and functional. You can do that, you're not required to do that. Um, so I hope that, I hope that speaks to that question, if, if, if people have follow-up questions. Um, I do have a follow-up yeah. question. So um, you're reading, so I'll just read from uh, 13.1 to 3.5. Um, it, it's really in t two parts. I mean, the way I read it, one is um, uh, you know, but one is more directive than the other, and that sounds like you're reading too. The first part says that our duty shall include, but it's not limited to, approving written plans for each election. Dot dot dot. Right. Uh, and then there's uh, there's a conjunction as well as an assessment and passive voice of how well the plan succeeded. So in your, in your reading, while it would be within our discretion uh, not to approve or demand written plans to be approved, it would be in our discretion uh, on how we assess how well the plan succeeded. I, th I think that's right. You, you, you definitely must um, approve a written a written plan, and I think that would, I think that approval would have to be done by a, a formal motion, where the plan is the written plan is submitted to you, and, and you have to you have to take a vote on that. Um, but I, I do see the term assessment is, is not requiring that that specific vote. Well, I think we had two, at least two questions last time. Uh, one was whether uh, this commission. Uh, has the ability, given the data points that we have, um, to really make a factual finding of um, <coughs> freeness, fairness, uh, 
uh, and functionality of the election versus what we have been doing in the past, which is um, attesting to the substantial compliance uh, or non-compliance with the plan. Um, you know, that, that latter you know, seems to be more within our personal knowledge, but there was a question as to whether, whether we're copying out, whether we should be doing more. So, so just on that point, I, I mean, the commission does have the authority to, um, uh, you know, request speakers to come in. Um, obviously, you know, you, you, you're entitled to question um, director arts, but, but you're, you're certainly not, you know, um, constricted in your authority to, um, to, to, to take the steps that you feel like you need to take to carry out that goal. I mean, there are, you know, observers of, of, of elections, you know, for certain elections who aren't part of the department if you feel like you wanted to invite speakers. In that regard, you could do that. Um, if you had specific questions for the director during the, the hearing or before the hearing that you wanted the director to speak to, you, you would do those things. You could do those things, but you're certainly not sort of limited to, you know, walking in here on the day of the meeting and, um, and, and listening to what the director has to say and then basically making your determination based exclusively on that. If, if you have specific questions about like, what steps could you take, we, we can talk about those, but at a minimum, you know, re requesting people to come in, requesting um, other people to come No, I don't have any questions about what steps we could take, um, uh, I, but, but I do think there was a legitimate question raised last time about uh, what would be practical for us to do uh, within a reasonable timeline before the next election to, uh, to certify uh, these three characteristics. And then I think the second issue that we had raised was really a policy question. I mean, do we want to be in the business of um, voting on freeness, fairness, and functionality of the election versus uh, substantial compliance with the plan where, you know, you know, we might, you know, we, the vote might be split. So what does it really say to uh, the public and public confidence in our, in our oversight of the election system if we have four persons uh, you know, voting yes on free fairness and functionality, and three voting no or abstention, where the no's might simply be because, hey, I need to see the results of whatever investigation is happening uh, relevant to a particular election. Yeah, I think from from my perspective, um, I think my interest would be, um, you know, in the future, currently it seems like the emphasis is on, you know, confirming that there's a compliance with the plan, but I think you know, my own interest would be, you know, the, the, the motion itself wouldn't be so so important, but just if the emphasis were on, let's be looking at, you know, how well the, the plan did these things as opposed to whether it was compliant. And, um, and then secondly, you know, what are the things as commissioners that we need to be able to um, evaluate that? Like, our, um, you know, personally, my own opinion is that because of the fact that the, the department is doing these things around transparency, it, it gives us confidence that if there were a problem, you know, the, those problems would be communicated to us. So I think that the transparency around the election is something that can give us confidence that these, these types of aspects are being, um, you know, carried out successfully or, or not. But um, are there, I mean, one thing I would be interested in knowing is are there things that, that as commissioners we, you know, certain types of information that we could be getting that would help us be more confident in knowing the answer to this question you know, in future evaluations. This isn't a direct answer back to that question because I think that um, to the extent we have wanted additional information, we see now, we don't, it's not always available. I think we'd all love to know what is in the DA's head, but we're not gonna get that information. But um, there's nothing preventing us from finding whatever information we need. It's incumbent upon all of us to be thinking about these questions and ask for information. And, and you know, the, the, the more involved we get, the better we get at asking the right questions, and that's just a continuing process. I, I'll address sort of a hybrid between your question and what uh, Commissioner John was saying, which is, you know, the, what really are we are we willing to do here? And I can only speak for myself at the last meeting. I had some concern about 
sort of certifying, I think there's a difference between certifying and assessing. And especially when there are criminal inquiries, as there was in this case, I think it is a lot to ask us to certify that something was free, fair, and functional. By the same token, I have no information to indicate that this wasn't free, fair, and functional. We have lots of information to indicate that it was free, fair, and functional. And so my assessment, as opposed to certification, is that this was a free, fair, and functional election. And I want the record to be clear that I'm not doubting anything about that. And we have gotten lots of information to indicate that that's true. So I don't know the answer right now to what an eventual vote should look like. But I really appreciate you, President Giordano, for for you know looking at this specific language and pointing it out to us. And I'm not convinced right now that the way we have been voting is really in the spirit of what this charter is. So I think we need to try to find a middle ground between certifying this was free, fair, and functional because we can never be you know we, we can never be that sure. But also making clear that we have satisfied ourselves to the extent that we feel is possible that it was free, fair, and functional, and based on our information, we believe it is. I don't know the magic language for a vote. We've heard that the vote we've been taking is legal and just fine, so I'm not feeling that we need to necessarily rewrite that now, but it's something that I certainly will be thinking about a lot before the next election, and I think, I think we should try to modify that to come closer to the spirit of this language that you pointed out for us. Okay, those comments. Um, for my sake, I do see the value in having a vote on this as it does seem to kind of solidify this with no more reading between the lines, but I feel that I would only be comfortable taking this vote if all the commissioners were on the same page as to its interpretation. How narrow or how broad do we want to interpret this? And are we leaving room for doubt, as in we have no doubts, therefore it's okay, or we do still have these unanswered questions, or not? I want to make sure that we are all making the same assumptions in the spirit of the law, because if we don't, then it does go, it does become a split. And even though in many ways, you know, legally speaking, that that's okay, uh, it doesn't, as Commissioner Young said, it uh, doesn't particularly look great if we're not all on the same page. Um, so if we can all be on the same page, I'm happy going forward. But if we can't, I don't think it's worth it. Okay, uh, we'll take public comment on this later. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just would like to say a couple things about prison drama. So as, as I read this, I just want to point out that in all these cases, it talks about an assessment of how well the plan succeeded, right? First, it's approve the plan, then how how an assessment of the plan. <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily say in terms of assessment of so just in, in terms of literal, what's literal here. That said, I would also say that just to say that it substantially complied with the plan does not equal an assessment. I think something more like actually going through and saying, okay, here are the elements of the plan, here is the evidence that the, the plan succeeded in a free fair, and I think that, as I read this, is what this is saying we should be doing. In other words, and, and from a process standpoint, I, I would imagine that being take, pulling out the plan again and saying, going by section, getting a report from the director, any, any metrics that might say that, that we did or didn't, that those sections of the plan actually resulted in success. Um, towards a free, fair, and functional election seems like that's what this is asking for, and that seems like the, the, you know, the balance between saying certifying the election and saying, did the election plan, first did the election plan be approved, actually succeed in carrying this out? Because the point, to me, of doing this would be to say, ah, we should add something in the election plan next time, right? That, to me, would be the value of the assessment, not necessarily to say it pass or fails a certain test. But, but what would, uh, Commissioner Donaldson, thank you for that, but what would be the end result of that assessment? It would be exactly what I said. It would be that, look, we have all the elements in here, we have the evidence that those elements handled the various use cases, let's say, that, that came into the department. Somebody you know, called in and said, I don't have somebody speaking my language at this precinct or whatever it is, right? And so, uh, and honestly, that would be, would be subject to debate, but the point would be that the assessment would be, did the plan work towards having this free, fair, and functional election, and to what extent, and could it be improved? That's what I'd be Yeah, so I guess that's what I'm wondering. I was wondering whether, um, your comment was coextensive with what President Jernotic is saying, 
uh, as I uh, hear his comment, his suggestion isn't that we simply uh, cert uh, certify that uh, the department substantially complied, but comply uh, in carrying out a free fair and functional election. Is that right? So in, in other words, um, it's the same standard that you're suggesting that would apply, but we, um, well, I guess I'm not sure what there's the same standard, right? Do you imagine some sort of grading process? I mean, what, what, would, that, what would that look like if, uh, if it wasn't just substantial, but an assessment of substantial compliance, but you know, compliance in carrying out a free fair and functional election? Well, I think my only view right now would be that it's more like the emphasis of our discussion around the election would be on the, on the, the freeness, fairness, and functional. And I don't know exactly what the, that would look like as a, an outcome. I mean, I don't, right now I don't necessarily think we, we would need to do a motion, but maybe a motion could be something like, um, you know, aspects that, you know, could be improved. We don't even have to grade in my opinion, but I mean, I'm open to, to I'm not even talking things. about grade, I'm saying like, Here's a pain, here's some potential gap. Should something be done about it as a possible discussion, perhaps a resolution on a particular area of the assessment that says, yeah, okay, fine, we can, we can pass a resolution that says it, it succeeded or was substantially compliant with the election. But, but, but what this says to me is, here's the election plan, here's the election. Did the plan succeed in producing a free, fair, functional election, and to what degree could it be improved? And that would be the essence. Could it be improved? Are there gaps or the things that should be in the election plan that aren't? Should be ordered differently? Should have different coverage, different emphasis? So it's not necessarily coming up with a grade of 1 to 10. It's a matter of saying, huh, here, here's a potential gap area due to there are this many complaints in this area or something like that. I will, as we're all thinking about what we want to do the next time, I will say I would, I think grading it on a 1 through 10 or an ABC would be a very bad idea. So um, I think, I don't think that's what we're talking about. But um, I will also say, in response to a couple of the comments about consensus, that I think as long as we're clear about what we are voting on, we shouldn't be afraid of not being unanimous. Um, I, we do have to be like, for the last for the last vote that w we were all so we were viewing it so differently that the vote would have come out very differently than what it was intended. That, that's one thing. But in the abstract, I personally think that our <coughs> work benefits when we have some dissension. And I think in, on those issues where we haven't had a unanimous vote, which isn't a lot, most of what we do is unanimous. But over the years, I've noticed that the willingness to stand up and disagree and the discussion that results from those disagreements, I think it makes us all better commissioners. And so I'm not suggesting we want to disagree, but I really don't think that our goal should necessarily be unanimity. Our goal should be a careful, thoughtful analysis of what's going on and whether we're having free, fair, and functional elections. And if different people want to interpret that differently, as long as they're clear on the record about how they're interpreting it, I think that can be a good thing for us. So just, as we, again, I don't think we're gonna do anything about this today, but as we think about that, I, I think that's a, a helpful process for us. Thanks. Let's uh, take public comment for the, uh, let's wait patiently. <coughs> Thank you, commissioners. My name is David Carey. I want to first thank uh, President Dronotic for having raised this issue uh, at the last meeting. Um, and I just want to say that looking at the language of the charter, uh, a few things. First is looking at the parallelism in that, uh, in that requirement. It actually says detailing an assessment of how well the plan succeeded. And it talks not about whether or not, it, it asks you not to make a judgment of whether or not the election was free, fair, and functional, but how well the plan succeeded in doing that. So it suggests um, an issue of gradation and not just a simple binary choice. Um, I'd also say that for many San Franciscans, it would not be a credible assessment to say that San Francisco elections are free, fair, and functional. And I would encourage you to not make such a finding. They're not free and fair and functional. As I look at reasons why they are not, they largely have to do with things that are outside the discretion 
of the department and this commission. Things like dealing with campaign finance or even you know, whether or not there's public campaign finance. We do in, you know, for, for local elections, but not for, for state or federal elections. Um, even campaign finance disclosure is <coughs> something that could be much uh, improved. For example, uh, the California Disclose Act, as an example, is, a, is an improvement that's very minor, but uh, is being sought. Um, and so for, for those reasons, I, I think it's, it's appropriate for this commission to consider that, that assessment of free, fair, and functional in a, in a rather broad sense, but to then focus your, your concern and your assessments on issues that are of discretion uh, to, the, to the department and the commission. Um, I think it's useful to, to make the assessment of did, did the uh, conduct of the election uh, uh, substantially comply with the plan, but then this all, you know, even if it did, to what extent did that support uh, free, fair, and elections, to the extent that it was in the department's discretion, is also something you should get some careful uh, assessment. Uh, in large part, uh, as, a, as a part of looking forward for ways to improve elections. Um, there, in, in order to, for, um, as I look at, at how the department conducts elections, one of the biggest barriers to making an assessment of whether it's, whether it supported uh, free, fair and elections as well as it could, is a lack of transparency in elections. And so I think there are a lot of, the department has made some good, good progress in that area, but there's a lot that can be done, including going back and looking at uh, some of the proposals from the San Francisco Voting Systems Task Force, for example. But thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jim Silver, and I would like to second David's comments and just say that there was a survey of knowledgeable people, election officials, and university professors, perceptions of electoral integrity. The United States, the beacon of democracy, placed 42nd. Uh, just ahead of Mexico, behind Rwanda and some others, much of it had to do with campaign finance, gerrymandering, and um, some other things. But maybe we should be looking at the entire scope of how the elections are conducted. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Silver. Hello, my name is Kelly Johnson. I do an election that is already, yeah, we put blood possum in, in our uh, election tables was one of uh, the best elections we had all year. And the only thing, and one of the elections, and we should be free full, free full of all our year comedies and what we put on our piece of paper about the election that we um, had it was explained for a lot of reasons and the elections as a disillness. But now I'm mean, getting better if things are a whole lot more clear clear and more substantial to teachers. And I'm working with for construction working for our very bigger point of view of what we need to improve our business in our areas and to have it to be checked like they're doing already on on eight and teaching people about how to build the houses with the other you know, for all these, which uh, uh, will give us a good check of uh, rebuilding our substantial report that has already been, you know, put down because uh, one thing that they had never, they always been against, you know, in the White House is, you know, President that can stand for, for credit and 
Es mag sein, in der Kern ist, aber wir sind stehen mit Butler, Election Tales, they, they have been informed with a lot of information that we have seen already built into construction. And uh, I think this has been one of a simple and thoughtful way of that have been already processed and I think that we need to, to make sure that, that this theft stuff don't keep going on because when our world is put together in one just that it's going to, you know, go into a different change of matters that we have under obligations and uh time's up. Miss Johnson. Thank you, um, and commissioners, thanks for your work here uh, tonight, especially on this particular issue. Um, of course, I think it just raises the question in total of the work that's been going on here um, for years and just recently with a hyper-focus on transparency, as Mr. Kerry mentioned. Um, it's a bit of a red herring question, a bit of, uh, of um, uh, it, it just doesn't really make sense to overanalyze this, in my opinion, because the free, fair, and functional part, I think the functionality is probably uh, reconciled with um, sticking close to the plan, and that is something that you can easily um, pass judgment upon. The fairness of it is another word, and of course that gets back to the vendor control um, issue. and. Uh, to your great credit, of course, you're you're bringing that issue forward uh, in a pioneering fashion, so that uh, everyone is well aware that there are issues there. Um, that being said, I think a couple things that could be um, helpful. Is, one is I mentioned previous uh, cameras placed upon the. Uh, central tabulator so that when the keystrokes are being entered into the central tabulator there could be a uh, possibility for um, the uh, inspectors or the people witnessing that that choose to want to observe could actually see a real-time screen of those um, keystrokes being put in that would be something until we get to open source that would just be another risk management. Not to say that somebody wants to enter things that are inappropriate, but just to set a precedent for the rest of jurisdictions to say, hey, while well, we've got proprietary software and all this vendor reliance going on, perhaps we could put a camera in place just in case um, somebody somewhere wanted to inappropriately enter something and uh, create bad results. Um, aside from that, I think it's a kind of a moot conversation because you're already doing everything you can properly to manage the risk so that it just reverts back to the plan. I think the, the operative word here is the fairness part and of course the only per people that know if the election is being conducted fairly at this point is the vendor creating the software. So thank you. Okay, um, is there uh, further discussion before we move on to the next item? We'll have a chance to continue. Yeah, to just one yeah. comment. For what it's worth, um, I'm just looking at the charter that um, uh, the deputy city attorney helped with Friday here. Uh, detailing um, modifies the approving the written plan, so, and, and not the assessment. That's just my read of it. It says here, the duty shall include but not be limited to approving written plans dot 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 detailing the policies, procedures, and personnel. It, it, it is not my reading that um, it's our duty under the charter to detail an assessment of how well the plan is used. Whatever that's for. I agree. Forever. Okay, uh, anything else? Okay, let's move on to item number seven. Discussion of possible action regarding future director's reports. 
And Commissioner John, would you like to introduce this? Yeah. This is idea. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So this is uh, this is uh, a topic that we raised after the last director's report when um, Deputy Director of Elections Natalia Luzina um, uh, reported that uh, uh, stood in for Director Arnes and uh, went through the reporting. And it struck me then, and I raised it then, and then the commission discussed uh, uh, whether it would be useful to, uh, instead of having a, a wholly oral report, uh, to instead have a, uh, a written report summarizing um, the activities of the department uh, in advance, something like a one-page email. That way, what we can do is, uh, instead of uh, spending you know, three to 13 minutes uh, listening to an oral report, uh, read it in three minutes before the, the hearing and then um, and then spend the rest of the time uh, asking questions. Uh, and, you know, it, it actually is very helpful to be reminded what the charter says, um, you, know, you know, our duties are the <coughs> general policies for the department uh, and assess, you know, policies, procedures, and personnel that are used to conduct the election. It seems to me that, you know, we'd be able to do a more intelligent job of that. Um, if we, uh, you know, focus less on kind of the day-to-day -day recitation of the day-to-day -day tasks uh, and, um, you know, delve more deeply uh, uh, into uh, how we perhaps policies or how we those things. So that would be my suggestion and uh, I, I, my motion would be uh, to, to have uh, the, the director of elections prepare a uh, a written summary in advance of uh, each commission meeting. Okay, uh, were, you, were you actually making a motion or is the motion that you would make? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. Okay, um, is there further discussion? One, one thing I'd like to ask Dr. Arnes, would you, um, is that like a reasonable request, do you think? Is that something that you'd be able to do with by impacting your, um, your other duties, or? You say one page? Is that what I said? Yeah, one page is fine. Uh, also, uh, the challenge, though, is this idea of only policy coming in my reports. That, I don't think really, that's not what we do. We're not policy and actors so much. We're actually doing the day-to-day -day work. Uh, so, maybe give me some examples. Well, okay, so one of the policies. Yeah, yeah. sure. Here, here's an example. So, uh, and that's and that's not what I'm saying. Um, so, for instance, uh, in your director's report today, you talked about uh, outreach, and you said, um, you know, among other things, that uh, the outreach department participated in nerd night and MTA work. Uh, and just going by the um, just going by the last uh, uh, set of minutes. Um, uh, deputy, the deputy director said uh, the outreach participated in an event called Homeless Project Connect. And that's fine, and that's a fine recitation of facts if that's what it is, uh, but that doesn't really help us assess, um, you know, whether that's, you know, what the department and the uh, and outreach should be doing, and uh, whether it's doing that efficiently, and whether, it, you know, those are the appropriate, uh, you know, those are the appropriate tasks uh, to be focusing on. Um, I mean, it's the job of the commission to, uh, to set general policies uh, and to assess, uh, you know, assess uh, the, the policies, procedures, and personnel that will be used to conduct the election. And it just seems to me that if we had a, a written report saying, well, this is what we're trying to achieve uh, by participating in Earth Night in December through January uh, 19th uh, and participating in MTA work, uh, you know, these are these are the goals we're trying to achieve. This is why we participated. This is this is what we're doing. This is how we're spending the time. At a minimum, that seems like what uh, the commission would need to make an intelligent assessment. You see what I'm saying? I'm not asking for a policy statement, but I'm asking for an intelligent way to uh, assess uh, what it is the department is doing. Can I, Susan? I think what I what I understood this motion to be is simply that the report be a written report, and I think what you're saying is that. Our discussion during the meeting could be more around the policies rather than, you know, the, maybe the nitty gritty day to day things that might be listed in the report. Is that the correct summary, Commissioner John? 
Yeah, I mean, right. So I'm imagining that if one writes a draft one page email saying this is what outreach did, uh, that might, you know, in drafting something rather than stating an oral form, you know, uh, well, a person might look at that and say, okay, well, this is, you might add, this is why we're going, this is how to assess whether that's an intelligent thing to do or not. So he wasn't, he wasn't saying the, the report should be limited to the policies, it was just we hope the commission, um, you know, reflect on the policies, I think, that the written report. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work uh, that way, because uh, I mean, so much of what we do is not an explanation of why we're doing. I mean, we get 10,000, you know, we're, we're five percent high on the number of ballots that come in at a certain point in the cycle. That means something to us. You know, it's, it's not. I don't, it's, I'll try. So you want basically you want a one-page report that says what why we're doing what we're doing. Does is that, is that how I understand it? I guess what I was interpreting this is. You know, I was busily writing notes. It's like, oh, I have a question, and then I forgot even to commit. I wrote, and it just was—it was very hard for me to intake all that. I, I believe you guys are doing, you know, and John, you're doing a great job, and you guys are doing a lot of work. It's just that it's very—it's <clears throat> hard to keep up with just the oral presentation. It would be nice if I had like even just bullets for these things, so I knew what they were in advance. So I, I'm not sure if that's different than than uh, Commissioner Young's uh, proposal. But my interpretation of this would just be to have. You know, the bullets you'd like to cover are sort of like your oral your presentation. And then we still, I, I would still appreciate being talked through more details. Yeah, so um, I I think that's better than nothing. Uh, by nothing, I mean nothing in written form because at a minimum what that allows us to do is to make an assessment from meeting to meeting what progress has been made rather than rely on our oral recollection plus a, uh, you know, kind of a hearsay summary in, in, uh, you know, through the secretary. Uh, of what a person said, and I'd rather have it in written form myself. So at a minimum, I think that would be useful and improvement, uh, but I do think it should be more than that. I, mean, I think it, uh, the question of you know, asking oneself why, right? What, why was this an appropriate thing to do, and uh, how do we assess whether you know, the department's doing a good job at that particular task? That is something that if I were to ever make any type of assessment on how well a plan succeeded in carrying out a free, fair, and functional election, that's the type of information that I would need. So it, it, I think the answer is yes, I mean, Commissioner Donaldson, I mean, if, uh, if that's all that we got, I think that would be an improvement, but I, I, do, I, I do think we need more. Commissioner, you do you want to um, Right, I, I, I think the director knows best what are the key results and activities for the department, and, um, what I'm hearing is that uh, those key results and activities drive the work, and often they are day-to-day -day activities, and that's why you're reporting them to us. So um, a way that I've seen that kind of work done to, to help capture it over time um, is, is like charts even that, that say kind of key results activities that, that you define, that these are the things that you're working on and that, so for example, the activities that you each report, there's a, there's a pattern, right, to you, your reports. And so those could fall into categories. And um, the, I think what I'm hearing Commissioner John mention is that then there's a, a, a year-to-date progress on those activities. Say, for example, we're, we have, we need to outreach X number of organizations or X number of people. That's the outreach goal. It's part of an outreach plan this year. We're at this many, we're, we're going to do that many more, right? Or that, oh, these are the target populations that we're trying to reach, and that's why we're going to X, Y, and Z. You know, engaging younger voters or engaging people who are in transient situations or, you know, it, maybe that helps to put it to the context of not just um, the what, but the why. Um, and, and you probably know this already in your head. And you know, maybe I think the question is how, how to put that in a way that makes it easy for you to also report in those categories on a regular basis. And, and I think that also could tie into what we had talked earlier about the Elections Commission Charter and, and how to better assess 
That is that if there is if there are regular kind of categories that we report on to put that in the report, then we know that oh this this category went up five percent, went down four percent, which is significant to you, right? Those are significant you know data that you're tracking. So then that way it's a it's like a set template, and then we have an idea of the the pre and post and what are some trends or things that might be changing that might be hard for us to kind of track. Um, just from like our own notes from prior meetings of your of your updates. Whatever makes sense um, for you to start something that that works for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So, um, but I'll give it a shot. So, but you want a brief report? I take it, right? Is that what you're after? Brief but detailed enough to be intelligible. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, so you've now mentioned three times to get three times that it's one page. Yeah, it might be one page. No, did you say that? I'm sorry. Did you say one page? I well, I mean, that's that's what I had in mind. Uh, but I can imagine circumstances when one page is too much or one page is not enough. So you know, uh, I, I don't think the word count is itself what what makes a report intelligible and useful or not. It's the content of it. Um, but yeah, that's I, I suppose that is what I had in mind. Something like two, if you want to work on two hundred and fifty words, I, I suppose. I think you may have. I think maybe during your motion you might have said one page. Yeah, that's, I think that is what he's picking up on. But I guess what I'm saying is that it's not the specific page limit that makes it useful or not. It's uh, you know it's what's in. Uh, so my motion was uh, a written report in advance of each meeting. Yeah, well, I think this will be a product, ongoing project. But yeah, I'll, certainly I'll uh, submit reports, I guess, the Friday before the agenda. That's when you post. Uh, well, I mean, we could we could work that out. But I would imagine it would be you know Wednesday, Thursday, the week before, around there. Um, I mean, we could talk about that, or whoever was the president at the time. Oh, that's right. I mean, that's more of an administrative issue, I think. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. And then I, I don't think we're asking that we only have to do the point part, right? We also still get the verbal out there. Because things can happen in four days, particularly if you go to the election and all that, right? So it's written, and then we still have to talk to you. I mean, it's up to the commission, but what I had in mind is that the written report would serve as a point of departure for the discussion rather than, I mean, what I would hate to see is written report then forcing Director Arnes to repeat the, what we wrote in the written report. I mean, that, that doesn't seem like a good use of time. At most, you know, if he has further updates that happen in that span of four or five days, he can give that, but it's really an opportunity for us to uh, ask intelligent questions based on that rather than having recite. So, would this change the nature of the director's report? Agenda, it sounds like it would. Well, I think it, it may be shorter. I, mean, I think a lot of what you said in, read, in words could be could be just read. Okay. But I also I also think that the format of the report may, you know, I think in the course of discussing meetings, you know, director, you can see what you hear suggestions and how it could be improved or short or lengthened or. Um, let's take public comment on this item. I would say uh, maybe Sally Johnson, and I think that you got a good point, you know, that we will receive and to try to explain it a whole lot to where you understand where you've been and stuff like that. The, the policies and I wanted to go ahead and do those policies to where you can understand the definition of what I'm working on and what the goal is to be real you know, work and do it for you your doing we had a little understand and you with your benefit so and also work world and you know but you go at level but measurements so we we process and we can you know I'm not yet but I won't be 
Jesus. So, I hope that they didn't understand the policies that I write, that it would, would be so difficult, you know, and in our technology to gain more for our, 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 all our benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Okay, seeing no further public comment, is there any uh, further discussion before we take a roll call vote? Okay, uh, Secretary Hewitt. Commissioner Donaldson? Yes. President Jadali? Yes. Commissioner John? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Vice President Rowe? Yes. Commissioner Stefan? Yeah. Commissioner Hewitt? Yes. Okay, so the motion passes unanimously. Okay, let's move on to item number eight. Election of Commission Executive Officers. Discussion of possible action to elect the Commission President and Vice President per Article 5 of the Commission Bylaws. Okay, so on this item, this description here is more or less the same as it was last year. The process is going to be that, you know, we'll open up the floor to nominations. First we'll do for President. And then, um, and then if the person agrees to run, then that person will be considered nominated. And then there will be a, and then the vote will be that you name the person that you're voting for. And then the person will be to have the majority of uh, four votes to be elected. So, um, so I thought what we could do is um, you know, start out with public comment on this item. Okay, seeing that. And then let's uh, have commissioner discussion before the nominations. Does anyone like to make any comments? I'll make a quick comment, which is um, I think you've done a fantastic job uh, as president. I really appreciate the hard work you've been in. Uh, I'm going to nominate somebody else because I feel it's important that we rotate if we can. Historically, we've done that, at least since I've been on the commission, and I think the commission really benefits from getting more people involved and, and you know, having direction from other people. So I don't want to be, I don't want that to be taken as um, anything other than high praise for your presidency, but I, I will be making that nomination tonight. Okay. I would like a clarification of being the second most junior person. I do know Commissioner Rowe has uh, been president before. Do we have, um, <coughs> somebody tell me, who has actually served as president and vice president in the past? of the current commissioners? Does anybody know? Can you say that again? Uh, who of the commissioners that are currently here has ever served as either president or vice president of this commission? Yeah, Commissioner Ewing was vice president when I first joined. I don't think you've been president, though. No, I was vice president for the portion of the first year before this semester. Commissioner Rowe was also president. You know, I, the comment I want to make is that if um, you know, I would be willing to be president for another year, you know, starter, short and so. So um, let's open the floor for nominations. I'd like to nominate Commissioner Chung. Okay, Commissioner Chung, do you accept? I respectfully decline. I'd like to nominate Commissioner Rowe. Vice <laughs> <laughs> President Rowe. Can I find out if we're going to have any other nominations before I respond to that? Um, sure. Why not? I'd like to nominate the President Judah. Okay. I'd like to accept that. I'll accept. Okay. So are there further nominations? If Commissioner or Vice President Rowe and myself as the two nominees. Okay. Um, so let's do a roll call vote. Secretary Hewitt. Commissioner Donaldson. Second name. It says your name. I say that. Say your name. Uh, President Giordani. Or, uh, Commissioner Giordani. Oh, Commissioner Giordani? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Giordani? Yeah. <laughs> you say the names and all. Okay, Commissioner, okay, Commissioner Donaldson? Or just go through everyone's name? Go through everyone's name. They'll say who they vote for. Okay, gotcha. Commissioner Donaldson? Commissioner Giordani. Okay, 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 Comm
Okay, President Rudani. Um, Ms. Hall. Commissioner Jen. Uh, Vice President Brown. Commissioner Harris. Well. Uh, Vice President Rowe. Well. Commissioner Savant. Uh, Commissioner Jerdan. Uh, Commissioner Yu. Commissioner Rowe. Okay, so Ms. Hall. So it's 4 3 in favor of Commissioner Rowe. Okay, uh, Commissioner Rose is elected president. Congratulations. So, um, Vice President Rowe will be the president at the conclusion of this meeting. So let's move on to the election of the Vice President. So we have a similar process. So, um, do you open the floor to nominations? Commissioner, I nominate Commissioner John. Do you accept? I accept. Okay, are there further nominations? I nominate uh, Commissioner Trudani. Okay, Tom accept. And further nominations? Okay, seeing none, so let's, um, Secretary Hewitt, take a roll call vote. Commissioner Donaldson. Commissioner Trudani. President Trudani. Um, myself. Commissioner John. Com Commissioner Trudani. <laughs> Commissioner Pears. Chair Dominic. Vice President Rowe. Commissioner John. Commissioner Savant. Commissioner Pears Dominic. And Commissioner Yu. Commissioner Chair Dominic. Six one in favor of Commissioner Chair Dominic. Okay, so I'm the next Vice President. And um, yeah, so that, that concludes this item. So let's move on to item number nine, agenda items for future meetings. So if I, um, so for the next meeting, um, Director Parents, you said the budget would be ready for? Both okay. the third, yeah. So that'd be next month. And the two two items, oh, I, I should have said this during my report, but um, I was, I'm still preparing the commission annual report, so I, I'm aiming to have a draft ready for the next meeting. And in the middle of that right now. And then the, the two items that I mentioned at the last meeting were the director evaluation and the secretary evaluation. And um, the commission secretary started in April. So I was thinking, well, I think the next president can decide when, when we'd like to have the, these two evaluations. I don't really have anything. Are there further items? Okay, uh, public comment. Good evening again, my name is Jim Silver. A week ago, the Secretary of State, along with Citizens Across California, defeated the fourth proposal, legislative proposal for introducing and voting into California. Uh, we won that one, and I'm very glad about that. But what I'm not happy to report is there are now three initiatives to put internet voting on the ballot that the public will decide if we're going to use internet voting or not in California. Um, one just cleared the Attorney General's office, two are still there for a review of title and description. They're going to have to collect the signatures. The two that are still there seem to be backed by a very expensive law firm, and therefore well-funded, and we are afraid they're going to make it on the ballot. And I would like to ask that this commission uh, soon, or in the next few meetings, come out opposed to internet voting or specifically casting ballots across the internet and make it public and weigh in on that so that we have a chance of defeating this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Silver. Hello, my name is Sunday Johnson, and uh, I think that the violence or what that public has in mind, you know, that why, you know, our physics would be a whole, whole more successful in our in explaining, and that the, the areas that we have in our 
my um, major mom for um, marriage that uh, was already supposed to be in that um, category. And uh, they already knew, knew and say nothing to me about where it's at or what he moved to or nothing. And it's been totally a disadvantage for publics. You know, when you're commissioned, you know, through uh, it's just rarely but in success for uh, California. And I think that, you know, it's been, you know, a totally discard on what we do in our process and in doing the management and control for our publics. And we haven't, you know, really attuned to the um, successful uh, uh, dyslexia areas, which have been missed out on colors. But, and uh, it's been like a, a fight to our lives, you know, and we don't need to keep on, you know, building this, this business of we, we need peace and make it to where people can be, be able to work their own. And, you know, I have already been, um, they put the advantage of murder killing on Market Street all this month that I've been and been getting sick because of the uh, news that I've been doing. And uh, we know the whole streets really grow and really told me and it shouldn't be here. No, because the manager that was in 2001 was a whole lot more clear. And now it's been where and this about demolished because of some people that no longer take over and use enforcement and stuff. So I'm, I'm using some uh, police control economics to learn about these tips so I can be in a better state. And this is where our top always, you know, not be in focus. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you again, uh, commissioners. I just wanted to um, read in uh, based on uh, Mr. Soper's words and uh, the legislation that uh, is being proposed by Assemblymember Ting. Um, with the California Association of Voting Officials, we don't take a position advocating internet voting or smartphone voting. Um, we do recognize that uh, these are likely to come into effect eventually, um, and that uh, certainly there already is internet voting in Alaska and for overseas voting. Um, I just wanted to read real quickly a statement that was made within the State of the Union address by President Obama. Um, recently, his last State of the Union uh, speech, the last one of his, of his presidency. He said, we have to make it easier to vote, not harder. We need to modernize it. For the way we live now, this is America. We want to make it easier for people to participate. And over the course of the coming year, I'm going to travel the country to push for reforms that do just that but I can't do this on my own. Changes in the process of not only who gets elected, but how they get elected will only happen when the American people demand it. It depends on you. That's what is meant by a government for and by the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, David Pilpel. First, I want to thank the commission uh, for the three commissioners who were serving at the time for the opportunity to serve on the redistricting task force. It was quite a challenge, but, you know, we did that. Um, and to the new commissioners, since I haven't been by in a while, 
nice to see you in regard to mr sober's comment i just wanted to caution the commission about taking positions on legislation that the city normally does that through either the board of supervisors or the or the state legislation committee this commission can certainly urge that the city take a position with regard to state legislation and i believe that you could set a policy for how you think internet voting should work if it ever does happen but i think that you should check with josh your deputy city attorney on what powers and duties you have with regard to taking positions on legislative matters and particularly potential ballot measures thank you thank you mr google nice to see you again with respect to mr sober's comment i would personally be interested in having an agenda item like that at some point in the future first i would check to make sure it's within our purview further commissioner discussion before we adjourn i'd just like to thank president judonic for serving over the last year i think you've done a lot of great good work even though i've only been a commissioner for a couple months i've been very conscious of what this commission has been doing for many years so i appreciate your your contributions thanks i second that i third me too so i think so really and look forward to having president bill be our the president so congratulations again so so that concludes the meeting everyone the time is now 7 42 p.m have a wonderful evening meeting is adjourned